it's great. Okay, let's go ahead. <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, uh, first of all, thank for the organizer for organizing and for inviting me to speak. And uh, uh, before I will start, I will apologize by saying that I'm a complex analyst and uh, this is uh, uh, so not my usual audience. And uh, as a result, it's a qu quite, I'm trying to simplify quite technical talks. So, uh, and the price I pay is by like precision and uh, accuracy. So some of the things, there are some hidden assumptions that I won't tell you in order to make things simple, but uh, so I apologize once in advance and I won't say it at every point uh, uh, during the talk. And uh, okay, so now, uh, 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 let's start, and, and the talk is about a very, very classical problem, more than a hundred year old. Uh, some, some problems about uh, Taylor coefficients in spaces of smooth functions, and the approach here is a, a moment summation method approach, which is the generalization of the Borella plus uh, summation method, which was summation scheme, which was mentioned before, and probably you know, and this is some sort of a generalization. Okay, and let's start and then uh, we will see. So the setup is of the problem is the following thing. So we are interesting, interested. Ah, and one more thing probably I would say before we start, I'm doing everything in one variable. The reason is that uh, the extension to more than one variable, variable is trivial in everything I'm about to say. So uh, it's like, it's like a gener generally a one variable theory which can be extended to as ma many variables as you want and it's not much effort to do so uh, we will restrict this kind of conversation to uh, one variable. So uh, we have an interval, uh, we just fix it as half open interval, zero, one, zero here is a special, for the talk zero is a special uh, point and we are uh, after, after the We denote uh, by half at uh, the Taylor coefficient at the origin, and the Borel map is just the map that takes a sequence as a function to its sequence of its Taylor coefficients. And the question that we ask ourselves basically, there are three questions. The talk will be devoted to the last uh, two. One is given some, we are given some subset or subspace uh, with some structure of C infinity function. And we want to ask some properties related to this map restricted to this space. So first of all is what is called quasi-analyticity, basically when uniqueness theorem holds, so when the restriction of the Borel map is injective. Uh, the second thing, the second problem, uh, it's what is called the punctual image problem is just to describe the image of the Borel, uh, the, uh, of, uh, of the Borel map. As we will see, in some spaces, this is like have a trivial result in a sense, and in some spaces, the structure of this kind of uh, uh, image of Borel map is very weird. Uh, and uh, the last uh, problem is the summation problem. So given some sequence in the image, how to recover, how to construct a function f with this kind of Taylor coefficient. I, if a priori this kind of space is quasi-analytic when there is a unique such f, but even if it's not and there is not a unique one, how to just construct a function with in a given space with a given Taylor coefficient. Basically, this is uh, the problems that we are going to. Uh, and in order to make this, so this is quite vague. In order to make this concrete, we are going to fix on some. Uh, uh, ah, before that, uh, so just let's look on two extreme, rather uh, rather uh, simple uh, thing. So. For in the infinity in the all C infinity category, we can realize any sequence. This is what is called the Borel lemma. Uh, uh, and okay, so C infinity functions are definitely not quasi-analytic. They are flat, non-trivial functions. But it's uh, other than that, everything else is trivial. You can construct explicitly a function with given Taylor coefficient. Just you can write an explicit formula for it, and it's not. And in the uh, uh, in the in the real, for real analytic at least for real analytic germ so okay also the image is trivial right we can just uh, write if we have a real analytic germ so so the image the Taylor coefficients of real analytic analytic germs is just all sequences which are bounded by uh, some geometric progression 
just because they know uh, serious convergence uh, and that. And what we will be interested in this talk is spaces that do doesn't have this kind of, of uh, metric, uh, metric, uh, 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 metric description, that you can just uh, describe the, set, the, the image of the Borel map in, in just a list of inequalities. We'll be interested when we have some so some condition on the signs and some conditions on the on like the uh, not only on the modulus of an but on the actual structure of an and basically so to make uh, things precise uh, we want to to we will we are going to quantify smoothness in the following way which is a very classic it's called it was originally considered by Adamar but it's called Danjo Akarleman classes and it's the following thing it was it's parameterized by some uh, uh, positive and non-decreasing sequence M. And uh, so this class CM is also infinity function such that for any closed sub interval, uh, there is a constant such that F satisfy this kind of bound. It's bounded by a so factorial is just a factorial. The constant is just like a scaling thing. And uh, the important thing here is the, this ML. Uh, okay, and as I just I will return to my apologies in the beginning, everything that all the inaccuracy that I'm eating from you is some sort of regularity assumption of this M. So different theorem of different regularity assumption and this kind of things, and I'm ignoring this completely, and I will assume that everything is extremely regular without saying it. And so, on. Okay. Uh, so now, what uh, about uh, this kind of uh, sequence? So if the supremum of M N uh, the nth root of mn is, 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 is bounded, then cm is just real analytic function. Why? Because at every point, if this kind of, uh, uh, at every point, this thing will be just says that the Taylor series at every point in the interval have finite radius of convergence. So this will just be a real analytic function. Uh, okay, if you take mn to be n, 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 n factorial to some power or uh, the gamma function, uh, this is very similar in terms of growth to taking n factorial to some power. <laughs> uh, these are what are called the uh, Gevre classes, which were mentioned, this is why I'm mentioning it, and we will touch them uh, again soon. And, uh, and uh, in this kind of classes, the quasi, so the first problem that I mentioned, the quasi-analyticity problem is, 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 is very classic uh, from, I think, uh, 1919, so more than 100 years ago. Uh, which was solved by Danjoa and Carleman. The first by Danjoa, some uh, specific things, and then uh, the general case in Carleman. And it said that if the sequence M is log convex, then the, this class is quasi analytic, meaning the Borel map is injective, if and only if this kind of this kind of uh, uh, series diverge. What it means, it means that MN can grow to infinity in order to be quasi analytic. These bounds are not have to, you don't, you can do things larger than the analytic, like strictly larger than the analytic class, but not extremely large. If you take this MN to be too big, then you will have flat function with, uh, you will have like non trivial flat function, and otherwise you won't. Uh, okay. Uh, let's continue. Okay, so so for us we are going to 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 and, and okay the idea is now to study these kind of problems uh, for uh, first for the quasi analyticity problem which is trivial to this kind of uh, so describing the image of the Borel map and how to recover and describe the summation machinery that uh, given a, a Taylor coefficient recover a function. Uh, Okay, for us, it will be more convenient to work not with the sequence MN, but with uh, its nth root. Uh, this is somehow parameterized the class in a unique way. So uh, uh, this is what we call LN. And uh, so, so for example, uh, if we take log, uh, log uh, alpha to the power N, uh, when this kind of sum that we had before will be something like N times log N to the power alpha. Uh, so uh, it's diverge if and only if, uh, sorry, alpha is A. Uh, if and only if A is smaller than one. And if A is smaller than one, it's not what I mean. This is just an example. Okay. Now, uh, what about uh, uh, the image? So about the image, 
the image, okay, sorry, it's a different B, but it should be the same uh, Borel, uh, sorry about this, this is the same curly B, and this is the same curly B, uh, that we had before. Uh, about the image of uh, the Borel map, naively, we can just, okay, the class were, was defined to be all functions that satisfy this inequality. So the image, at the, in particular, in the origin, it have the same kind of inequality. So the image, uh, the, the, the Taylor coefficient is just all sequence that are bounded by some, uh, by some uh, constant to the power n times our sequence mn, this what we call lambda n. Okay, so now, and this is what I call, this is what I call a metric, this is like a metric set, so everything is only depends on modulus of things, so this is essentially a disk. Uh, okay, or a large, uh, so uh, like uh, uh, the generalization of a disk. Uh, and uh, what can we say about this kind of thing? So if ln is larger than some power to the power n, so if, if we are, uh, ln is larger than n to the power epsilon, this is, this is uh, the Gevre classes from before and so on, uh, then this is actually we have equality here. So this is just the set. We have a metric description. But if, and this is where, where we're going to focus, ln is smaller than every n to the power of epsilon, what is called a slowly varying function. So like the logarithm, powers of the logarithm, iteration of the logarithm, this kind of thing. Uh, then, and this was known for a, for, for, for a very long time, this inclusion is proper. And uh, in fact, more is true that there is no metric description of the set. And, and this is a, why I, that's what I will try to, to explain. So very, you cannot write this kind of set only in terms of inequality with mod modulus and inequalities and this kind of thing. This is impossible. This set of this kind of set for when ln is slowly varying, like the logarithm and this kind of stuff. This is a, a, a very delicate set and we will, uh, this, the plan is to try to describe it in some sense. Uh, and one, one example that shows that you cannot do the things in a metric way, is what is called Borel conjecture, which is now a theorem, but it was conjectured by, by Borel, uh, and people still refer to it as a, a Borel theorem. And uh, I'm not writing who prove it uh, uh, for a reason, because uh, many people claim that they prove it, so I'm just uh, ignoring this argument. Uh, uh, although probably most of them are not alive, not alive at the moment, so probably doesn't matter. Um, but what it says is that that if we have a a, a, a quasi-analytic class and the function with positive Taylor coefficient, then it's immediately uh, real analytic. So it means that in quasi-analytic classes, uh, you cannot have if your Taylor coefficients are large, then they cannot be positive. They have to have some sort of cancellation. So this is uh, some sort of a hint for this non-kind of uh, metric uh, behavior of this kind of uh, images. Okay. So this is the setup that we are going to 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 to, to look on these kinds of uh, problems. And uh, and and uh, now. The way to attack it is what for this kind of class it was suggested by uh, Bowling in the, in the paper or in the preprints that we never published uh, in 1936. Uh, but this kind of approach of studying this kind of problem for uh, this kind of techniques to this kind of problem was suggested by him. So, and it's what is called the moment summation method. So this is how we are talking about methods of summing divergent series, and it's a very specific kind of method, also parameterized by the same M MN. Uh, so uh, we are given a sequence mn, the same thing. It should go to infinity uh, first in terms of the nth root goes to infinity. And we assume that it's a moment function, which means that there is a function k such that uh, mn uh, or yes, uh, such that mn uh, is, are the moments of this kind of k. Okay, a moment uh, um, in uh, zero infinity. Okay, now we are given a formal power series. This is the power series that we want to sum. Uh, if we have a, 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 
then we consider not our sequence, but our sequence divided by this MN. These have more chance to be convergent because it has smaller Taylor coefficients. We are dividing it by MN. Uh, if it has non-zero radius of convergence and it can be analytically continued to a neighbor of R, so a priori we assume that, uh, sorry, not this color, a priori we assume that it has some non-zero, uh, this is where A lives, non-zero radius of convergence and it can be analytically continued along the, uh, along the positive ray. And, okay, these are all the assumptions in order the summation method to work, uh, and such that the integral, this kind of integral, when we inter uh, this is kind of a Laplace type integral, converge to A, A converge to some, something, then we say uh, A tilde, then we say that this A tilde is the M sum of A, okay? This is the definition of moment summation method. This particular case, when you take uh, MN to be N factorial, this is what is called Borel Laplace summation. I will touch it in, in, a, in a minute or two. Uh, okay. And uh, so this kind of procedure is extending the, the classical notion of convergence, and therefore it's a summation method. And uh, okay, it has some, some properties uh, which we will touch. Soon. Okay. So, uh, but the, the important thing is it's here we, 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 we split this kind of uh, summation procedure to, to two parts. One is from uh, uh, sorry, the tildes are here. Are, uh, oh, this should be it. Uh, what we start with our formal with our formal uh, thing and we divide uh, we start with our formal series and we divide the, the coefficients by m and this is called the Borel transform and after that doing this integration this is called the Laplace transform or the generalized Laplace transform so the L L M Laplace transform whatever okay so in our kind of uh, procedure. Uh, probably the tildes are opposite signs. So here is the, we start here with the formal object, we divide the Taylor coefficients, when we integrate, then we get uh, non for we get the sum, okay? Why it work formally? So in order to, it's not always work, not every sequence is summable in this kind of machinery, but why it's work at least formally, when by formally I mean by polynomials or for physicists, uh, so like when you're allowed to change uh, summation and integration, this kind of stuff. So why it works formally, right? We start with something, uh, sorry, we start with something like, uh, we start with something like uh, a and uh, x to the n formal. Then we consider this kind of a x to be uh, this kind of uh, a n over m n plus one. Then when we integrate, what we are integrating is we integrate zero to infinity a x of t a k of t dt. This is equal to the integral. Uh, sorry, is there a question? I you I'm not uh, I'm hearing that you are speaking, but it's uh, like very uh, weak, and I cannot uh, distinguish what. Ike, is it better now? Yeah. Okay. No, Sorry. So uh, when you write a of x in uh, here, it's sigma of a n divided by n one plus one times yeah, oh. x, x, times x yeah. n. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Okay. Yes. Thank okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So here, right? We have this kind of uh, sum x t to the power n m n k of t dt and the summation procedure summation procedure this is like I will write it uh, this is the, the formal part if we are we're allowed to change the order of summation and integration when we are typically not but okay if we were allowed to do this then uh, this will be the sum of uh, uh, x to the n uh, probably here should be a n as well a n integration zero to infinity uh, over m n t to the n k of t and then plus one and then plus one uh, dt and 
And, and this is exactly, so the MN cancel out, so AN x to the N, so this is what you have. Right, this kind of thing is exactly what's defined to be MN plus one, exactly to cancel the MN plus one in the denominator. Uh, so this is a, a summation scheme. But what is nice about this summation scheme that it's somehow, it's separated to two pieces and each piece have an important role in, in math in general and in what I'm about to say, each piece is, you can study it in separately and this is an interesting thing by its own right, but we think about it as a summation scheme. So as a summation, Sorry. yeah. Uh, do you have a kind, what kind of assumptions do you have on K? The, uh, just uh, integrability? So currently for, for defining it, just that it exists and that it's an, like an integral, so it's a moment sequence, it's have some, in, in the fact that it's a moment sequence implies some non-trivial things. But uh, after that, in the end, in order that what I want to say will actually work, it should be analytic and regular in some, in some domain uh, containing like the real axis. And I, 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 I probably won't get into this kind of details, exact details, but you can write it explicitly. Thank uh, you. Uh, but currently we didn't assume anything. I would say in a second, a little bit what I'm assuming. Uh, so why we, uh, this is a bit of digression about this particular summation methods and why we like them and uh, or not, at least uh, why, what are their advantage corresponding to other summation methods, or I don't know. Uh, first of all, this kind of procedure is commute uh, with uh, just uh, as Taylor coefficient. We are just dividing one by one the Taylor coefficient by something and multiply it by something. So it's commute with multiplying, switching X with a constant time X. And therefore, if it's commute with this, it's commute with the infinite in the infinitesimal generator of this group, which is this kind of differential, this Euler differential operator, uh, uh, which so you can solve equation. So as with the Laplace transform, you can if you want to solve equation, you can do the transform, solve it there. Sometimes it's algebraically simpler and come back. Mm -hmm. uh, and then two properties which are very naive uh, for. Uh, in general for summation method that these things that we want in order to work with them it's what is called stability and regularity stability means that uh, if you sum starting from n equal to zero and sum uh, from n start to, to, to one and take the difference then you will get a uh, a naught and you will get the first one so you, that you can do that uh, and, and regularity just mean that uh, for convergent things, you expect to get convergent things. So the same sum. So it's not, a, it really extends the notion of convergence and not uh, give some, some other values to convergent things. Okay. And, uh, and typically you also want that it will respect analytic continuation, uh, this kind of stuff. And, uh, and, uh, uh, what the reason that uh, I'm uh, uh, presenting this so so how the, the, the to understand this kind of uh, things it's typically if you want to understand how summation method act on analytic functions you basically need to apply it only to one analytic function which is the identity for Taylor coefficients and the identity for Taylor series is just the Cauchy kernel it's the series with all entries one it acts as the identity. In, in, our, in this kind of realm, okay? And so, uh, and, uh, so this kind of turns out that this kind of function, which is just uh, this kind of entire function, which is just e to the z, which is just uh, the, this generalized Laplace transform applied to the Cauchy kernel, it plays basically in terms of properties of it and of this function k, you can say everything you want about this kind of summation. This is parameterized by these two objects. Uh, so for instance, a necessary condition for regularity on, uh, for this kind of regularity and uh, stability is exactly that this integral is, uh, is uh, recover back the Cauchy kernel and this you want to do including in one. In, in one uh, meaning that it gives the value infinity, okay? In summation, theory in general, you can never sum 
the function one, 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 the, the Cauchy, you can never sum the Cauchy uh, kernel at the point one where it gets the value infinity because the difference between one, 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 one and the shifted, this, this kind of uh, uh, one, 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 one sequence is invariant by shift so you will never get stability. Uh, okay, I will assume something more, much more stronger than this kind of thing. Uh, uh, and then we'll do examples and you will see that it's typically the case that uh, this kind of uh, K is uh, asymptotically equivalent to, to, to one over E and vice versa. So let me give just some examples. Uh, so uh, the first one is the Borella plus. So here MN is n factorial, k of t is e to the minus t, and e of z say is e to the power z. This is rather magical, uh, but this, they match perfectly, but they always almost match, uh, or under some regularity, they almost always, uh, almost always match, and this is enough. In the logarithmic level, they are typically match for so regular. So another example, right, you can do, uh, uh, this is sometimes a tribute to Mita Gleffler, uh, you can take uh, Mn to be uh, gamma of, uh, I don't know, An plus one, extending this kind of thing, and then uh, probably K of T is something like E to the minus uh, T over A, or almost up, something like this, and uh, E of T is uh, asymptotically the same thing. Let me do it log here. Uh, T over A. Uh, you have, uh, let's do one more, which is due to bowling summation method. Uh, it's Mn equal to log N to the power N. And then you get K of T. Log of k of t is uh, minus e to the t over t. This is double exponentially in growth. When you decrease mn, you increase this function e and you decrease this function k. So uh, this is a double exponentially growth. It's uh, so in, uh, and the sa same thing is true for this kind of thing. So this is uh, basically some examples. And, uh, and now, uh, now we are going to. What we want to do is to apply this moment summation method to the Scarleman classes, and if I didn't lose you, then uh, we are in a very good place. Uh, uh, <clears throat> okay. So, some natural domain for to defining this kind of uh, Laplace, and we want to apply this kind of uh, mechanism. So, some natural do domain to apply this uh, kind of uh, generalized Laplace transform is the following set. Uh, you take uh, this space AM, it's functions which are analytic in some strip and satisfy growth condition inside the strip, exactly this kind of growth condition. Uh, and this is some sense, the maximal space that this Laplace transform can be applied. It's not exactly the maximized because instead of a strip, I can take something which is narrower or uh, something uh, like this, but roughly speaking, it's the maximal space that uh, this kind of uh, uh, operation can be applied. Oh. So now we apply moment summation to Dungeon Kalman classes, and uh, uh, there are some anomalies here. So uh, this, as I would say, I said before, started with a Theorem of uh, uh, Bowling uh, from 1936. Uh, uh, it's specifically for what is called the logarithmic class. So when Ln is the uh, uh, log n, so Mn is log n to the power n. And it says the following thing. It says that the Borel, tra the Borel transform, so this kind of uh, machinery, map cm to am to the space we just defined of analytic function. This is a bijection with inverse the Laplace transform. So in particular for any function in the cm, uh, you can recover uh, you can recover a function by its Taylor coefficients do, using this kind of machinery. Okay, 
but in fact it's much stronger because it's the bijection we can do very fancy function theory in the in the one side is uh, like quasi one side you have quasi analytic functions the other side you have analytic function function theory is much more developed than quasi analytic function theory in some sense so you can do very fancy quasi uh, function theory on this side and got, come back and uh, uh, surprisingly there are things uh, that you can do in the quasi analytic side and go to to fun to prove non trivial results about function theory but this is like a, a proper bijection and in some sense it's this it's a, it's a way to describe the cancellation of the function, right? We start with a element f in Cn. So it means that its Taylor coefficient is bounded by uh, something like uh, c to the power n plus one uh, log n to the power n. But what this theorem says, it means, says, says that if I will divide this Taylor coefficient by log n to the power n, so if I will look on f n to the power n over log n to the power n. This is a priori should have finite fine radius of convergence, but because of this kind of description, this theorem guarantee that it will have analytic continuation to a whole street and some growth restriction and infinity. So this is the way, this is the reason why it cannot be positive. Positive things don't want to be analytically continued in a sense, in a direction. If you have a positive thing that can be analytically continued to the right, it can be analytically continued globally. Uh, uh, so, so this is a way to, very accurate way to describe cancellation in, in the Taylor series uh, of this kind of uh, function. Okay, so then I, I, I was attempting to generalize, I was sure that this theorem is true in general, I was trying to general, uh, uh, generalize it to, 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 to other uh, sequence and something surprising happened. Uh, and uh, it was something surprising and Bowling mentioned, uh, at least uh, this was, uh, it was written, his Bowling work was written in Hendrik in Swedish, so up to some Google Translate, he was claiming that it should work for all classes, uh, for all uh, slowly varying like uh, kind of, uh, and this was quite surprising that it turns out that this kind of logarithm is a threshold. So. The same theorem exactly is true if Ellen is below the, the logarithm, but it's stopping true uh, after the logarithm. So in this kind of sense. So if Ellen is smaller, is also over the logarithm, then the same is true. I'm not even write, no, not writing it again. The same kind of bijection holds. Uh, but if you have uh, you have a, 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 a class larger than the logarithm, then you have this inclusion is still true, but it's a proper inclusion now, and there is no bijection, and there is no recovery, and you can actually construct functions. With, you, you, this is very explicit. Uh, so now we are left with two things, and they are both interesting in some sense. One way is to the problem that we start with is uh, uh, describe this kind describe this kind of uh, set, uh, the image of the Borel map, which is the same as the image of the Borel transform, which is essentially the same as describing the Borel map. It's just dividing termwise by something uh, in this kind of super logarithmic case. So when we are above the logarithm, and describe the image of the Laplace transform uh, on our set. Uh, in, in this in this kind of super logarithmic sense, in some sense, and this is a very vague thing, uh, this is the maximal set where m summability is applicable. You can increase the set uh, by taking narrower uh, instead of a strip, taking a narrower thing, or replacing analyticity by something weaker than analyticity, and everything is covered by this field. But I'm not, I don't want to get into it uh, because of this, and so this is uh, somehow. Uh, to uh, kind of uh, problem solve. So now uh, I, I want vaguely to, to, to explain uh, uh, what is going on behind, so in this kind of two situations. Um, and I Borel map or the, or, or the Borel transform is this kind of uh, thing in the super logarithmic thing. 
So we have two, uh, we have two things. Uh, one is duality. This is was rather magical when 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 we when I, I found this. It was like I don't even now I don't I know how to prove it, but I don't have a good good explanation for why this is true. Uh, but this is some sort of duality between non-quasi analytic and quasi analytic classes. Uh, so you start with the uh, uh, right, I'm using this kind of mn is ln to the power n, and you start with a non quasi analytic. Uh, so, meaning that one over nln is convergent. Now you define a new class, a new sequence ln tilde, which is given by ln sum one over, uh, let's do it with k, klk. K okay, goes from n to infinity. This is our sequence time this uh, our original sequence time the tail of this integral. This is a smaller sequence, and okay, uh, this is the ln. Ln is always is quasi analytic. Okay, ln tilde. I mean, given a non quasi analytic uh, class. We construct a new one. This is a very simple, like a calculus exercise. That, uh, uh, that uh, the, it's basically integration by parts. If it was integrals uh, to show that this is a, a quasi analytic, uh, but it is again. So we have new sequence, and this induces a uh, right uh, M N T. And what the theorem says that somehow this kind of cancellation is universal. So. Somehow, uh, so what is uh, so, so in the theorem? So B uh, M tilde of C M tilde. Here I need to write origin. Here B M C M. Uh, okay, what this theorem says? It says if we normalize the coefficients in the right way by dividing the coefficients that correspond to the M series and the coefficients by this to the coefficients that are correspond to the M sequence by MN and the coefficients that correspond to the M tilde sequence by MN tilde, then we get exactly the same set. So the cancellation structure is identical once you normalize it properly uh, somehow. So, and this is uh, uh, okay, this is basically a fact of life. So it reduced the studying of. So do we reduce the studying of the non-quasi analytic class to the study of the quasi analytic class? So at the currently at the current stage, we know uh, everything which is below uh, uh, log n. Uh, so uh, we know uh, what happens when m n is uh, okay. L n is of log n, and this theorem tells us the same thing. If, if uh, let me write it like this, so we know. Uh, when ln is smaller than log n, and this kind of theorem allows us to also treat ln, which is greater than log n, one plus epsilon. So the gap is really close. Now that we shorten the gap to very big things which are very close to between log n to log n plus one epsilon. So log n times log log n, things like this. This is the gap after this kind of uh, thing. So, and how to do, in general, how to do, how to even kill this gap is, uh, and this is, uh, okay, this is uh, unfortunate, but uh, necessary in some sense, is by something which we call splitting. So essentially we start with some function f, uh, start with some function f that live in the interval i. We take i, we think about i in the complex plane. We, here we put omega plus, here we put omega minus. This is our interval i. And then in take, in we take instead, we split f to f plus plus f minus, which f plus is holomorphic. In the, oh, okay, let's do it like this. Each one is holomorphic in their half and still have the same CM kind of uh, condition up to the boundary, still they are very smooth up to the boundary. And quite remarkably, we cannot describe the set of this F, the, the, the image of the target of this F, but we can describe, and I won't write it explicitly in terms of inequalities of this, uh, or in terms of uh, inequalities of analytic function in the upper half plane, we can describe uh, uh, 
this kind of BMF plus separately and BMF minus separately. And what is interesting about this, that in order to recover, in order to apply LM to this kind of thing, we cannot integrate along the real axis as before, but we need to integrate on some curve, gamma plus, which is M dependent. There is some curve, a splitted curve, which you cannot move by much, that you have to integrate there in order to recover a function in this kind of way. Now, of course, this kind of decomposition, uh, I wish probably should mention, this kind of compo the composition is non-unique, but is unique up to an analytic function. So it's not unique in general, but in terms of the things that I care about, uh, uh, analytic functions of small Taylor coefficients, they are not affecting much uh, in this kind of thing. Uh, so it's almost uh, like a unique decomposition, so it's not a, 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 as nice description as the one before, but okay, this is life and this is what it is. Uh, uh, this is uh, just uh, 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 one thing that I wanted to say. And the final thing that I, uh, I want to say is, is it's, so it's about this kind of... Uh, uh, just about the sum, summation procedure as a summation procedure, what we actually get. So what, when we apply the Laplace, la the, 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 when we apply the generalized Laplace transform on the set which it's defined basically, and what we get. So let's start with a, 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 an example. So our example is the, the classical one, MN is N factorial. It's what it's called uh, when, LMAM is what is called one Gevre summable function. Okay. Um, and how to describe this kind of things? Uh, this kind of functions you can describe in that there is some disk tangent to the origin, which is zero, and there is some disk and they are analytic inside. So let's call this disk D. And the uh, functions that are, uh, so F is in this kind of uh, LMAM, F should be holomorphic in D, and F should be uh, in this kind of C and factorial. In a complex sense, which I'm not defining explicitly, but uh, probably you can understand what it means. So the bound, the, on the, uh, this is, on the boundary of, and on the, the, clo the closure of it. So this is an open disk. It should be holomorphic inside with some smoothness on the boundary. Okay. Uh, this is what is called Gevre summable. Okay, I mean, you take union of this disk, this is what is called Gevre summable function, basically. A one Gevre summable function. Uh, and, and the idea, there is some dichotomy. If we, when we took, log n when we took the boiling case we didn't have we only have this kind of uh, cm here and we didn't have this kind of extra holomorphicity and the question is where this kind of holomorphicity is coming from and what 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 is going on here why we have this kind of this is a uh, uh, ah it was just a random noise right uh, okay so the question is, there is some sort of a dichotomy here between uh, holomorphicity inside in the classical case, in the like, uh, by the way, this kind of description is due to, to Nezanlina, it's also from 1919, uh, this kind of uh, description in this uh, context of the n factorial. Uh, and later on, it was started to be called Gevre classes and this kind of thing ca came later, uh, that's the no notion. Uh, but, but what I'm trying to say is, 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 is that somehow this, there is some sort of uh, 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 gap between these two kind of results. And I, I, I was trying to think if there is one way to, to, to do this kind of uniform, this kind of two, uh, two things together, and there is. And in order to understand it, we need to describe analyticity in the disk in a, in a slightly different way. So how to describe, we want to forget about the holomorphicity part and to describe analyticity in the disk just by looking on the real plane. So what is going on? So what I'm trying to say, uh, sorry, I'm trying to, uh, 
I have my disk here, which I'm holomorphic inside, and I have a point here, X. So the radius of convergence of this point X should be exactly X. Meaning that if I have a function holomorphic inside, it will have a bounds of this point, uh, up to a constant. Right? So this is a, a different way to quantify smoothness. The Karleman classes is independent of our position, but we have additional smoothness which are position dependent and it gets worse and worse and worse when we uh, close to the origin. And it turns out that if you combine these two kinds of things, in general, you will have a very general theorem that covers all the things that I just said, and I, I'm not writing it explicitly, but basically it's what we call non-homogeneous Karleman class. So we consider function F, which satisfy inequalities of this form, mm. distance for minimum, this wedge. So you're taking qualities, functions that satisfy two inequalities, one for the soup norm, and one which is position dependent with this one over X. It's the same as saying, uh, this is by the way, very similar to say that, uh, I don't know, dn to dxn of f of e to the X is bounded by uh, M and tilde. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's almost the same. This inequality and this inequality are roughly the same. Uh, so there are like two re regimes of smoothness. And turns out that for any M, there is an explicit MN hat, which I can write in a formula, uh, uh, which I'm not going to do. I will give some examples, but I'm not going to, do, or maybe probably I will just show two examples. For any M, there is an explicit MN hat such that uh, when you apply this procedure, this is exactly what you get. And there is nothing special about the logarithmic class, just that this kind of inequality, this always, will be always the minimum. And this is, won't be the minimum. And there is nothing special about the n factorial, and the, the, the n factorial class, uh, just this thing will become a factorial. Uh, okay. Uh, so let me just show you the correspondence. Probably I forgot here a factorial. Uh, right? Let me do a factorial here. And okay. And this is just uh, for for uh, I, I I don't want to write a formula. It's quite complicated to write the formula for a man. But this is just like uh, the correspondence between this kind of. Form. So we we'll start with m. The m hat is. Is, is given by some formula. And then when you, the, the, the non-homogeneous Karman class, which corresponds to those two weights, is the largest space in some sense that you can apply this Borel-Laplace uh, summation game. Uh, these are all spaces. Uh, they are closed under products and this kind of stuff. And they are like, uh, like proper algebras and so on. Uh, uh, right, I should probably stop, so I will stop. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening and uh... thank you speaker okay. 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 uh, uh, questions